kind of music has come to the Southern Highlands. The hum of electric generators echoing back into the farthest valley. Men harness the rivers and strung wires across the peaks and valleys, bringing cheap power to a land of kerosene lamps and long back muscles. Power for new industries, new jobs for people of the hill. The music came too late for the old and weary, but it's a tonic for young people just starting out. Sue White told me last week she means to buy an electric stove for her new kitchen. Sue is kindly persistent when she sets her heart on something. Her daughter is too, I know. She's one of my pupils. New ideas in farming came along with the power lines and light bulbs. A mountain farmer years ago planted according to spells of the moon. When his land wore out, he cleared some more. He knew there was something wrong, but that was the way his father did it. All that is changing. Now he can talk things over with a county farm agent and the federal government's farm advisor. He learns how to grow tobacco, how to start the young plants in a sunny patch and harvest the crop in the early fall. Tobacco puts cash in his pocket for necessities that he can't grow or build. He hears about plowing a furrow along the contours of a sloping land so the rain won't wash away the good topsoil. And he lets machines do more and more of his work. That way he gets more done and doesn't feel so tired when the sun goes down. He learns the sense of rotating crops, growing cover crops to be plowed under, so the soil he farms today will be rich and sweet for his sons. It used to be that a tree was cut down if it was in the way. Now the Highland farmer protects his woodlot and thinks of his lumber as a crop. It's a new idea with him. He takes care of the forest and the forest takes care of him. Proud old mountains have a way of strutting over us and bossing us around. But we're beginning to talk back now. Every chance I get, I go and visit with kinfolk of youngsters I have in school. Because old and young, I try to make them understand that we've all got to go along together if we're going to get anywhere at all. Our people love this land. They mean to stay here until the mountains tumble into the valleys. But they need no longer be slaves to the mountains if they listen to the music of the future, the hum of dynamos and the song of machines. A poet once said that something in a hill child dies when he goes down to level land. We all know that the Highlands are a little bit poorer for every child who goes away from them. My dream is to make life worth the struggle in the Highlands. That's why I feel easy in my mind when night comes on the mountain and I hear my neighbor singing the old ballads to his grandchildren. In a summer morning, are still up here and then are gone. Do you remember yon green mountain, where you and I first fell in love? The little birds would sing so sweetly, and even to 
those little... I know a good man is helping me make my dream come true. Helping me hold the hearts of these young Americans closer and closer to home.
up on a mountain far from the lights of town. The old man holds a shotgun and never puts it down. He keeps the fire in a bowl of hot and looks out at the stars. On the stump the little boys put lids on mason jars. Moonshine mountain reaches to the sky. If you look to the pale moon I should see the wood smoke rise. See the wood smoke rise. On a muddy winding log and road in a battered pickup truck The old man sits and grumbles, says ain't just just my luck Let this old truck break down on this mountain road The sheriff's men will catch us, hauling our last load Moonshine mountain reaches to the sky If you look to the pale moonlight you see the wood smoke rise See the wood smoke rise They catch him, they dynamite a steel But he'd just build another one on further up the hill He's getting on up in years and he died in 92 Where he died they found his jars of homemade Mountain Dew Moonshine Mountain reaches to the sky If you look to the pale moonlight you see the wood smoke rise See the wood smoke rise See the wood smoke
Pottery.net. Now, the thing about making pottery that people don't realize is that clay is basically rock. And it's where water has weathered over rock for millions of years and it's formed into deposits. So when you are working with a piece of clay, you're working with silica or quartz rock. And when you heat it up, you're basically turning it back into rock. That's why clay will stand up like it does. Now we use water to lubricate it. It's like the oil would make it slick. You get it centered best you can. Open the ball up. Pottery making is a practice craft. The more you work at it, the better you'll get. This is my 35th year making pottery. It looks fairly simple, but there's been a lot of pots that have not been quite so successful. And when you're pulling a wall, you're just stretching those little particles of silica out. But the beauty of clay is that as soon as you touch it, it just springs alive. I tried to quit making pottery one time back a few years ago and like it went crazy, I couldn't stand it. And there we have a pretty bowl. And you can be standing here making a pot and thinking about the next pot. Pottery is just that way. It's a lot of fun. It's work, but it's very enjoyable work. Now, let's move over here. Okay, now the next step that we'll go through is we'll take a pot after it's dried for a day, and it's got the what we call leather hard, it's stiff. And we tool the bottom because it's got a little bit of a trash look to it right here. And then after we tool it, we'll take leaves and mash into the clay. Now the next thing we do with my lovely assistant here is to put the leaf into the clay. So we'll lay, these are real leaves that we get from around here. We use a lot of maple leaves because that's what I tend to like the shapes of. We'll lay it on the clay and then they'll take the roller and roll it and press it into the clay. Now the leaf itself burns away but it leaves the impression after the first firing, which, and I'll show you how that process is done later. But you can put, you can put a lot of different designs into it now that will uh, make it a pretty pot. And the blend between the shape of the leaf and the color of the clay and then the color of our glazes gives it a nice effect. And it makes you think about the mountain. Now we need to do water. Right. Now, after we've made the pot, you can take the leaf off if you want to, and this is the impression that's left in the clay before we fire it. Another thing that we do is to carve different seams into the pots. These are lamp bases, and you see we can carve a cabin with the trees in it. We do churches, we do grist mills. We do a lot of things that remind you of the mountains and the, and the, uh, the scenes that you've seen while you're here. We do uh, replicas of uh, the, the homes up in Cage Cove. Just a lot of different things. We do dogwoods. Here's some luminaries with, uh, with the leaves impressed into them. See, so watch. Just take the leaf off. You can either peel the leaf off or burn it off, but either way, the leaf's going to come off, and that's the impression that it's going to leave. Now, this is my drying room. 
we pump a lot of heat into this room to get the speed up getting the moisture out of the pots because if you put a wet pot in the kiln it's going to explode because the heat's going to make that moisture turn to steam and it'll blow your pots up so you've got to get them bone dry this is what this process this step is what makes the two week process take so long getting them dry See these pots, they still got moisture in them because they're dark. You see how, how uh, buff it, the color gets? That means that it's getting dry. These are little bacon dishes that we make. You can speed it up, but you run uh, the risk of cracking them if you go too fast. My teacher always said the best shortcut takes not take one. So that's what I try to do is I go as fast as I can, but not too fast. These are some Rebecca pictures that we've been working on. These are the best kills. These, these kills will get out to a little over 1800 degrees and they get it to a, the fire the clay. They get it hard and it's very porous. See how the water will absorb into that? And we can put the glaze on it and it, it will soak up into it and fuse with it, and then when we put it in the glaze kill, it melts it and it fuses the whole thing together. This is where all the color is added to the pots. And all these different buckets have a different colored glaze in them. This is what the glaze looks like, like a big thick milkshake. Let's keep it stirred up because the chemicals in it will settle. Now you remember I was telling you a while ago that the bisque is what the glaze goes on. This is very porous right now. Now just pour the liquid into the got it. Pour the liquid into the pot and then stir it around. It just forms a coating. Glaze is a glass with a flux in it to make it melt at a lower temperature and a hardener to make it stay on the pot. That's the composition of glaze. So when you're coloring a piece, you're dipping it into a glassy mixture. And then when we put it in the kiln, we fire them to 2400 degrees which will in turn melt this glass over the pot. Now when we get a piece of bisque that's had a leaf impressed into it, it's been fired to 1830 degrees, so obviously the leaf is burned out and it's left this impression into the clay. Well, if we fired it just as it is, you wouldn't be able to tell anything. So, we take some black glaze and brush over the top of it and wipe it off, which makes the veins pop out. And then we'll take some wax and paint over the leaf, which will resist the glaze. The gla we, you glaze the pot and the glaze will beat off where the wax is. And, uh, and then when you fire it, it melts the wax away and then you've got a finished piece. Last step in the process is to put it in these gas-fired kills. Now, these are the real workhorses in the operation. The gas comes in through these lines. And these are the burners. The wire is stacked on the shelves inside the kill. So it goes 
goes in there and heats it up, swirls the heat around, and then draws it out to flue. This will go up to almost 2400 degrees. Uh, it takes about eight hours to get them off. Then we'll cool it down overnight. Tomorrow we'll come in and crack the door, start gradually pulling the car out to unload it. Reload it, push it back in, do the same thing next day. Okay, now we fire in what you call a reduction atmosphere, which is how we get these rich colors. And you're starving the gas for oxygen. And it's going, the gas is trying to find oxygen anywhere it can. See that flame? It's hunting oxygen. That affects the colors and the glazes. Turn the light out gives it a little bit more dramatic effect. But it's a beautiful color. I love to watch these things fly. Don't get any big kick out of paying the gas bill, but I love to watch them fly. Now, once the pots are unloaded from the kill, that's the final process. Then they go to the showroom. This is where we have our finished ware. And you see the different color effects from layering glazes on top of one another. This is two glazes. Uh, this is one glaze. You see how it flows to the middle? It gives those nice designs. This is two different glazes here. This is a beautiful color. Look at this. See how that, la that layering effect makes such a pretty piece? Now you remember a while ago when I was showing you the different scenes in the mountains, and here we have the uh, cabin, and the trees. Uh, here's another cabin. Uh, here's a cute little thing. There's another cabin. I've got different girls that, that carve these things. So you get to see different personalities in each one of these carvings. And I, I can walk up to them and I can tell who did what. Um, here's a pretty one. It's got a fence along the road. This girl likes to add a leaf to it that kind of frames it in. We've got a lot of different scenes. We try to make these pots to where they'll remind you of the mountains. And so you can take home a memory. And we try to make color that reminds you of the mountains. We try to come up with ideas that remind you of the mountains. This is my, what I call my mountain color glaze. This is the glaze that sort of built the shop. And I've got some pictures where we got this purple haze in the mountains and the red in the autumn trees. That's my mountain color. This room is our dinnerware and kitchen room. And we've got uh, various kitchen utensils. And we've got our dinnerware patterns. We've got two right now that we're using. This is our uh, mountain home set. And then this over here is our mountain night. It's a little darker uh, color to it. We've got mixing bowls, utensil jars, uh, baking dishes, pitchers, bowls, chipping dips. We have a lot of really rich color. That sort of sets our pots apart from a lot of people. And I do not know how to duplicate these things because these glazes do so many different things. 
and you can put the same glaze on a pot on three different pots and get three totally different effects. So each one is individually unique. And if you come in and you see one, you say, I'd, I'd like to have another one just like that, and it won't happen. It's just the different way that they run, the, the way they melt, the, uh, the way they interact with uh, each color. You won't see any of them that, that look alike. But that's what makes it a genuine alien line. No two pieces are alike. Just like people. We sell a lot of mugs. And if you look here, every one of them is different. And we'll have people come in here and they'll pick up half of them trying to find the ones that fit their hand right. But that's what I do. You can put it in the microwave, dishwasher. They even make the coffee taste better. But they're all different. They're all unique. Some of them have runs and drips all over them. Some of them are fairly stiff. Some of them have a sort of a matte finish to them. Some of them have a real shine to them. They're all different. But we have a lot of mugs, and we make a lot of mugs. You've always got room for one more mug in the cabinet. Why are you in Gatlinburg? I hope you have a chance to come by and see us. We're open seven days a week from nine to six. We're, we're here all fall and uh, we've got a lot of pretty stock for you. So I hope you can come by and say hello to me and the girls. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, baby doll.